Hello everyone, today we talk about the prototype of Hellenic Oplite uh, between the end of the 4th and say the mid 2nd uh, century BC. Uh, we will essentially um, stylize such prototype on the base of the early 4th century uh, Nereid monument from Xanthus in Lycia, but also from from uh, such a you know other sources such as the Bessay um, relief uh, in um, the Temple of Apollo in Arcadia, uh, and I would like actually to say that uh, uh, all of these videos based on say the individual fighter and its equipment mostly as we will see today. Um, um, there, there is naturally much more background to this that at some point we will discuss, and it, I'm I'm truly sorry that we haven't talked so much about hopletism uh, recently. We, you know that from essentially a couple of years we mostly began just from uh, at the earliest with Hellenistic warfare which this part actually still includes because we're not talking about, I don't know 6th or 5th mm, century uh, hoplites. So I hope in the future to find a way to, to talk also about classical warfare and uh, look at um, hopletism. That is uh, very overlooked, in my opinion, as properly as a historical topic, right? There are still many, many prejudices. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly about Roman warfare, as you know, as far as you know, ancient, ancient warfare is concerned. Also about Hellenistic warfare, ten, telling the truth, uh, Macedonian phalanxes and so on. But, and you know that I don't like commonplaces, I don't like cliches. Uh, and uh, I must say, though, that proper, probably with um, Hellenic obletism, there is there's the greatest amount uh, of such things, um, and uh, the world mm, picture is still deeply misunderstood at, at some levels. Like even you know can be um, a reenactment. It always tries to you know point out that there is some you know relevance in kind of modern reconstructions uh, to understand deep political, social, and military. Uh, realities that, uh, first of all, we know very few about, but properly we, we have n basically no mindset of. Um, secondly, because, yeah, I mean, the Greeks pass in second plan usually when, you know, the at least the Macedonians uh, come up, then, then the Romans, etc. So, um, talking about anoplite in general and hopletism, especially in this, could say, maybe not terminal phase of hopletism towards the, in fact, Hellenistic era, but still in a moment when opletism is melting away, the idea is, what is opletism concretely? And this is what, in a video dedicated to, essentially to armament, to, to, to gear, um, you know, naturally there is no room for, but we will discuss this eventually. Yet, uh, from such uh, prototypes, we can also um, hint at some of these dynamics and understanding better the, you know, um, how deep and um, let's say mind-blowing actually such such contexts and uh, really were as pro properly ancient warfare was independently of what we're talking about, like today about an Hellenic oplite or a Celtic warrior or, or whatever, right? Because I try to make it harsh to to always tell the story for from from this perspective that I began to mature a bit for my military historical interest spanning a bit. From in fact the Hellenistic era to Napoleonic warfare in a you know in an intensive sense that of course they like also other uh, eras, um, but um, and also you know a bit of my mm, you know history of religions background that helped me dramatically to to understand problems uh, revolving around properly the mindset of what we can try to you know um, to 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 historically inquiry, but by, you know, analytically speaking, with the base of actual evidence. Um, and, um, and I came to the conclusion that these worlds were much more violent than ours, of course, that you, I presume, everybody realizes it. Uh, if, uh, albeit um, stressing the, the much further level of violence that was properly constitutive of these mindsets in the first place, right? That is, it's not much the physical effort that especially modern reconstructions, uh, experimental archaeology, all these things tend to stress, right? But properly the fact that you can, you can even, uh, you know, wear uh, an Hellenic hoplite armor of, of the 3rd century BC, but that you will never even come to dare to imagine to, to, to arrive minimally close to, to the mindset 
these people had. Uh, and Hellenic warfare is so stereotyped because of essentially political reasons, as always, what we talk about history. Uh, at the end of the day, the ways we think about history are always political, right? There is no other way around that, even when we don't realize it, because most people have literally zero idea. The worst ones are the ones that say, no, I just like history. I don't care about politics because that's for ideologues. And, and it turns out they're often the ones that are trying to conceal that the most, right? In there, it's not the problem of being political. The problem is being objective and scientific in what you do, which is a wholly, uh, you know, different matter. But properly, the, for example, I don't know, the Reaganian hopelessism, the one Hansen talked about, the idea that these uh, phalanxes were just basically about a bunch of guys ultra press into lines that they poked each other's heads with this, you know, with the, their spears, trying to knock out each other, is basically a view of hopelessism, of political warfare that at this point in historiography is not credible anymore. Um, but it's also, in fact, not very much studied either. So that's all why this introduction, right? These hoplites were hyper-loaded in an aggressive mindset, independently from what people believe, right? We have to set in mind this, that uh, the problem of any, like, the cheapest quality in, in, in warfare in absolute terms is courage. And there is a specific reason why, because war is danger. Right, so the first thing you, you do need is courage, but unfortunately for, for humans, and that's the most instinctively easily thing to do, that is to say you're armed uh, from head to toe, you see an enemy you hate uh, there, um, and, and you want to kill him, right? And this is easy, like you can't convince any single person to charge straight at an enemy, to r risking he, your own life in the process to, to cut him down. Uh, what actually matters is to discipline the, the blind fury that people by default have when they engage in a fight, right? The whole path of civilization has nothing to do with the idea of being courageous. There's not a single army in history where the, the members of which are not courageous because we're by default programmed very easily to be mentally manipulated even at a very low level or to, to self-convince ourselves to, to go out there and risking our lives. That's literally the easiest thing ever. Don't ever think that humans are actually difficult to convince in that kind. What they're much more difficult to convince in that kind is actually take over the same instinct and remain disciplined in a formation and achieving things that uh, in war are literally the only ones that make the difference altogether that have to do essentially with intelligence, cold blood, uh, qualities most people generally don't, don't cultivate by themselves, and that pass through a level of discipline and training that are, once again, the single most important thing there, at least functionally speaking, then, of course, the motivation, you have to put it your, by yourself, also politically and socially, and that's the, the whole background that we can't discuss today. But properly enough, a person that just relies on, that just even thinks that is individually meaningful in war is literally the first one who's going to be taken out. Right. If you think that warfare is about brave, courageous warriors, just look at how many brave, courageous warriors exist in the world today. We have all crushed them under the heels of civilization. There is no society, no advanced society that rules the world that relies on that anymore. Right. And the whole um, uh, propagandistic bullshit of the idea of warrior that has been spread in the last decades for even here political reasons has absolutely nothing to do with that. Right, what you see there, or conceived, or styled like, or termed like, kind of reverential slash charismatic, and at the end of the day, mostly privatistic, um, almost classistic, and uh, uh, militaristic sense of like warriors have nothing to do with the reason why uh, our mm, you know governments and militaries can't wipe the hell out of, of an enormous amount of, of things. Right, and have nothing to do with the individualism of the single guy that is the hero. That serves either to get a, a medal, very often in, in a coffin, uh, rather than uh, being a, a, a moral value of civilization. Right, the moral value of civilization is born from the moment in which you learn to obey to authority in the first place, and you understand what authority stays there for in the first place, and you contribute to make it work for that purpose, right? 
Um, I will not digress further on even concepts like disciplines and, and so on, but the point is never think, in short, that uh, an Hellenic Oplite was that kind of... Um, uh, kind of strange guy that was just trying to avoid, inf uh, you know, uh, that was thickly packed information and scared to, to abandon it and, you know, would never charge just because there were, you know, historians in, in the 1970s that were uh, traumatized by the Vietnam War and physical contact and that had to, to replicate this, this, this uh, idea that, you know, that this was just a ballet with guys poking their heads with, with spears, right, in, in a lock formation, right? Uh, that is something that it would get just in conditions of need um, on the field. Um, uh, most of the this was something extremely fluid and elastic, and we are discovering it now, right? And if you have an idea of, of what, you know, more or less the mindset of these people really were since, since childhood, like to say there were people that were radically obsessed with figures of um, serial, um, um, you know, psychopathic killers such as Achilles and you know, and, and similar uh, heroes, right? And that were just anxious to go out there and and claim, you know, that that's super. You have pretty much the idea of the background where it stood from. Uh, but never think that these guys, for example, were anything uh, less, you know, um, you know, they were something particularly more. Uh, advanced than that in, in, in for that regard and that that is actually a value to make things work eventually against uh way more brutally um let's say um backed uh culturally realities like just the ones that could be you know Macedon at some level or Rome right or you know even certain other you know even tribal realities at some point um so another very crucial topic that we can't discuss today is properly what was happening to hoplitism properly meant, uh, or better, narrowly meant, in the sense properly of the ancient, let's say, the classical political phalanx in terms of, uh, yes, the Hellenic classical, um, the classical Hellenic phalanx, right, with, you know, this more kind of militia character and um, more, uh, in fact, a material way of war. We know that the, the basically Hellenic warfare with the the usual exception of the Spartans that also weren't this dramatic much uh, for ancient war standards ancient warfare standards were fundamentally amateurs of war by declaration. Right? For for, for in an Hellenic mind it, it, it was barbarians that made war. Right? But they, they just realized as civilization that war couldn't be avoided so somebody had to do it. And there was this way of doing it, which was essentially not being trained for it, largely, and uh, because that would have been a barbarous activity uh, that wouldn't reconciliate with properly the Hellenic lifestyle and the ideal of the polis, etc. Uh, that now is naturally in crisis, and that had never quite been actually something so standardized as we think. That's mostly an Athenian myth. Right, uh, hopelessism as we imagine it in the classical form, that is even difficult to point at and to, to, to trace its boundaries around, like, you know, basically what we know as that kind of warfare is just Athens and Sparta, right, historically. Even the north of Greece was already something else, practically, uh, and uh, all the various Hellenic colonies also began to, to fight it in very different ways. Um, but the, the problem is that with the rise of Macedon, uh, so also actually the decline of the, the Hellenic uh, city-states um, in, in terms of actual power, etc., and you know military capability, and eventually the rise of Rome, we have no uh, clear idea of how long and how much Hellenic, classical Hellenic warfare, uh, or better, the, the classical Hellenic phalanx, or whatever you want to call it, like, survived and where, right? Uh, uh, after especially, um, let's say, th this kind of um, equipment we discussed today was worn throughout most of the, the, like the 4th to 3rd century BC, right? But already during the 3rd, um, at least uh, among the major powers in, in Greece, uh, other types of infantry began to appear uh, more often. 
uh, we're talking yes about mostly due to Rothroy and um, to Rothroy, excuse me, and other you know lighter troops that, however, conceptually were not unknown even from much previous times. And this is extremely important to stress because most people presume it was like a, me a mechanism as if you know somebody one day invented a kind of shield and began to fight that way. That means literally having no idea what military history is. Um, but uh, it is objectively true that after 220 BC, there are few clear references to the traditional hoplite. Right? And this is mostly a historical problem in this proper, that is to say, we don't properly were not documented. This was a phase of decline of, as we've seen, not just the Hellenic polis themselves, but properly of, of the classes that had made hoplitism in the stereotypical sense we, we made. Right, and this means like also an aristocratization, re-aristocratization of warfare, or and or better, mostly professionalization. But speaking of properly of the city contingents, right, aside from mercenaries, um, what was the phalanx so on average of these cities? Well, you know, uh, we will see it because some cities actually adopted uh, the same Macedonian phalanx. Even the Spartans, we made a video two, more than two years ago at this point. It actually deal, dealt exactly with that, right? The Spartans contrary to the, the traditionalist stereotype that they, yes, they insisted on for, for a longer time at some level, but uh, at, at some point before their, you know, Sparta was knocked definitely out after a long decline, uh, had basically managed to, 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 to reform their army basically in a, you know, as an army of pikemen. And not even with such bad results, right? And this was true also of other powers. Uh, albeit uh, for the Poles specifically, that's rather rare because the phalanx is, I mean, the Macedonian style phalanx is something that requires properly a territorial power that sometimes not even certain Hellenistic kingdoms, like per Pergamon, for example, are, are documented to have had um, because of lack properly of um, of manpower of, of of land of capacity of putting that together with military colonies and properly yeah, more than else a political and social structure of a certain kind. Um, so also with, with the decline of the middle classes in this period, naturally um, disappear also the possibilities of uh, let's say documenting. Um, this this t times warfare as it had been done in classical times. That is to say, we objectively know much more concretely about the Hellenic, uh, uh, yeah, let's say classical Hellenic uh, phalanx tactics than we know about the Macedon the later Macedonian phalanx, right? Because the people who wrote at the time of of of, of the of, of classical times were usually the same people who were free enough and politically active enough to, to be the ones who fought in the phalanx, whereas a Macedonian phalangite, like, I don't know, a Roma, a, Ma a Marian legionnaire, uh, were just proletarians with basically no kind of education and just basically a bunch of beggars who were hired to, to make a living in, in warfare because that's the, the, only, the only way that they could have accomplished anything. Um, and they didn't give, of course, a damn about even writing or letting people know things that out of, about those details. Things that are, you know, there are renowned, for example, in Roman history, it's the same story. We have these treatises sometimes that are just something that circulated at court, basically, or around there, and we know nothing like what, what a centurion properly thought or what was the, the in fact, the NCO's deal there, because. Uh, by the way, it, you know, war was something so usual in those times that more or less there was always who knew how to make it. And, you know, what, what did people care also? I mean, socially or culturally, even speaking, to, to know more in detail than other things. As modern people, we're very interested naturally in this because we are a bit obsessed with mechanics, with, with technology, unfairly so, because if we listen to... In fact, these changes in, in temper, in tone of, of the sources, etc., we would understand much more about what this reality could be than being obsessed with things that renowningly alone have basically are basically irrelevant to any kind of warfare in any time, that is technology, for example, uh, and for real, um, because technology is, impo is important, but only when you have the possibilities of employ and the capacity of employing it in a, in a particular way, and if you don't, you simply get past and either find a new technology or a new doc better the, the new doctrine to 
to go past that, pro that asymmetry, and um, there is no proper, you know, uh, you know, some of the major war in the history of mankind actually show less technologically advanced armies winning, you know, wars because obviously enough, war is a political matter, right? And that's the single most important thing. But, you know, I, I presume most of the people who are self-terming themselves passionate about military history are completely unaware, given the, our own, I mean, today's mm, mm, cultural background, I mean, in popular culture, simply nobody talks about these things. Or when they do, they, they uh, maybe act a bit too sophistically and they don't properly like to show how these such things are wired and the sound either too intellectual, too theoretical, too abstract, whereas... That's where we have to insist but concretely, because that's concretely what makes the thing, uh, and you know, materially too, the thing done. Um, so uh, the idea is that these kind of hope lights were still in uh, in use among mostly minor powers and as militias. Right. The problem is that even the term hope light is controversial. We have explained uh, explained it many times uh, how. Um, you can't be a hope light, but absolutely having nothing to do with the political tactics. That is to say, uh, Hellenic equipment for a matter of, you know, you know, economical, technological uh, development was spread all over uh, the Mediterranean. Fam famously enough, was at some point, you know, the, the dominating cultural force um, in the ancient world. And, and there were lots of peoples uh, that... Uh, especially, you know, the, the aristocracies that equip themselves with opolitic gear, because that's normally what, what Greece or Greek, you know, uh, cities had to offer, but absolutely didn't fight at all as they did in Greece. That, as we were saying before, uh, it was something extremely narrow, right, to Attica and the Peloponnese, basically, for a certain amount of, you know, actually a short period of time, proper. Hopolitism was never static, even in, in its development, in its evolution. It was always something very, you know, on the move and fluid. Um, because we have to crystallize the ideal of ancient Greece. And that's also a problem, as we do with many other things in history, unfortunately, and failing clamorously in all of this. And to prove this point about the relatively, you, you know, insignificance of, of equipment, well, we have to say that at this point... I don't know, the 4th, the, the 2nd century BC, uh, the oplitic weapons didn't, hadn't essentially changed since the, se uh, the 7th century. Right? That tells you how, you know, uh, secondary things like properly technology uh, is. Well, of course, there wasn't also much of kind of a, a technological development in the, or potential for that matter in the ancient world as some like instead to stress this it was a hidden industrial revolution. It was blocked by either those terrible Romans or you know or or because they, they insisted too much on slavery. No, it's just because properly it was inconvenient to invest in technology because you couldn't achieve much because there was not um a milieu to, 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 to properly a spin up to, to properly implant some kind of technological achievements. Right? Um they knew steam engine, yes, and, and they always known it since Antiquity until the Industrial Revolution. But do you have an idea what Industrial Revolution happened in the first place? Eventually, not because they knew steam engine, right? Uh, at, at one, you know, they discovered it at one point. Right? It took much more than that. Um, so the main weapon of the Oplite is naturally the thrusting spear, something like between two meters and a half to meters uh, 75, uh, 75 long, right? to eight, nine feet, roughly, uh, with a cornel wood shaft, iron head, an iron or bronze butt spike, the sauroter, so the lizard killer, literally, uh, which could be used to plant, to spear in the ground, um, and, but more concretely also to finish off, you know, the, the, the agonizing enemies on the ground, um, and also, this this is part of the reason why uh, this part was usually made of bronze, still because it would not rust being planted in the ground. But part of the reason was of the sarota was that it could allow uh, simply another another point uh, to fight um, uh, with if if the spear broke like it was the case, right? 
the center of the shaft was bound with cord for a secure grip so that it wouldn't slip during combat and there were pretty dramatic forces involved as you can understand on your hand. Um, the spear was um, usually... Uh, uh, this is the... Uh, you Okay, Th this is one of those topics that you know would require four hours long video in the sense that to, to properly address it for the sheer um, conceptual background that you have to give to, to even start to talk about this thing because the, the overarm underarm grip slash thrust right so this is something which it's it's true it's not properly being researched that much right. Surprise, surprise, because the sources are what they are. But also, um, that is like a, you know, it's a non-problem, right? Because, surprise, surprise, any kind of fighter in any type of, you know, in any moment in history has always used weapons in the most various and changing and contingental ways he found useful, right? So, questions like, ah, an Hellenic Oplite would mostly use the spear overarm, right? As far as we understand, seemingly, that's from the sources, that's a more prevalent thing, right? But all the problem of, you know, this guy had to stay packed information, how was the problem, you know, he, in the front lines, they had to use the underarm spear because they can't reach more in the front, you know, they would have more space, but in the rear, they, they couldn't do, and therefore they had to grip the, 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 the spear at the, at the center or in, at another point, and they had to be careful not poking, you know, the, in the eye of the guy background, you know, all this thing. If you have a, if you care, right, about understanding what what warfare is, not just in the ancient world but in any kind of other situation, you have to understand that these problems do not exist, right? These problems are just in our modern minds. These people fought in the most different ways that mostly, as we were saying in the beginning, we don't even consider, right? Greek hoplites didn't just fight in the thickly packed formation that didn't move an inch from, you know, from a uh, lining um, and or from the distance between the various lines. These guys fought, you know, very elastically, right? And they could, they could use the spear in any kind of way, right? It's obvious that the overarm is better for a packed formation, right? It, it allows basically, you know, to, to exploit the, the space where the heads, you know, uh, altogether occupy less 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 uh, volume than, than bodies and shields, etc., that height. So uh, th there would be ways, naturally, to to cope with this in in a way that they evidently did, right? So it's not much that we, we have to feel good about ourselves in modern times to, to be right and say, I, I found the solution. You have just to accept that this thing happened and these people fought like that and that there were also lots of other people who fought like that, right? And that there wasn't such a dramatic difference between hoplitic formations and others sometimes. Um, in the essence of these problems of how you use a weapon, how you, you know, you cope with people next to you, all this stuff, right? Surely, yeah, things differ, but as I was saying, uh, overarm, underarm, these are things that were used at all times by any kind of trooper, right? Um, also, um, the... Uh, these spears, I was asked the other day, and I'm not sure whether I should make a properly an entire video to, to explain that or not, but uh, spears could be thrown, yes. Um, th there are many circumstances in which you would do like that. It's like a special force operator that under enough stress starts to use, uh, you know, uh, an M4 like, like a club, right? You have a pointy stick, you have an enemy at a certain amount of range. This guy, you know, you, you, you're you're ultra hyped, exalted, whatever, angry, that you, you throw this thing at the guy for, for no maybe rational reason. Or uh, you are about to break and you last thing you do, you throw your spear against the enemy. Or, as it often happens, as we know, actually it's one of the most dangerous situations, but it does happen during combats in, in close back formations. There is always somebody that attacks the enemy lines and then runs back, right? And, and this thing was done all the time, individualistically. At that point, the moment in which the guy turns is one of the most dangerous. Surely there would be someone who would throw their own spears at the guy. You can find dead people around, with spears around. You can't be armed in other ways. You, the, the guy in the back could give you his, his spear. Uh, there are lots of different ways that can happen, 
right? You have something that points the, the trust, pierces, you use it also as a thrown weapon. And it's, yes, it did happen. Um, the, uh, as we we're saying, the Underdark trust was awkward in close formation. Yes, right, most of the times, but also don't think that this was so radically closed all the time so they couldn't use it. No, it would be something like that at the same time. But simply the overarmed uh, grip seems to have been the most common for practical reasons that were there. Um, the sword, right, other aspect that we tend to, to underestimate in terms, because we say, you know, um, basically these guys were not properly swordsmen so they didn't have to have a sword. You go, you go to war and you obviously bring with yourself a secondary weapon like any kind of war. There, there's never been an Oplite, I think, that has never brought this, uh, you know, a secondary weapon with themselves. Because of all the possible reasons you, went, you, wanna, you may want to use that for, even for non-combat related purposes, um, um, the, the problem there was being trained or not being trained properly. And in these times, actually, with spread of mercenarism, and there were lots of, you know, um, phalangitic mercenary units around, uh, chances are that uh, these hoplites would be more capable of using this weapon than before. It was mostly um, a leaf-shaped cut and trust blade. Always cut and trust. Remember this. Basically, you know, every sword is cut and trust in this time, right? Don't ever indulge into the, you know, uh, mistake of saying, oh, well, you know, that, that sword just for, for trusting was designed for... No, right? Uh, this is usually said for the gladius. The gladius is, is something that cuts like hell like entire arms and legs. So uh, that is not just for trusting. Equally, the kind of the, the, the Atlantic Xiphos we're talking about here could do the same. Uh, it was about two feet, that is 60 centimeters long, was usually worn slung on a baldric, right? It was definitely a secondary weapon. Like, the main thing was a spear, but it's obvious, right? Uh, just for the sheer... Then normally, it's better to be equipped with a spear than a sword, most situations. It just depends on, you know, you know, in most combat situations in, in, in uh, let's say, in ancient warfare, like in this case, not always, right? It depends what you do with this. And that's also why people have trouble to understand it, because, hey, okay, so if, if, one, if one, one weapon was so good, what it, they had an advantage, why didn't they uh, always use this or that? Because guess what? Different fighters have different capacities. Right, and these capacities do not lay in the weapon. It's not about technology. It's about how these guys are trained, motivated, and what kind of tactics they enact. Right? Weapons do not make tactics. It's tactics that to make weapon. Right? There is always a double thread connection, but the, the capacity of a weapon of influence in a tactics is dramatically less. In most cases, military history, by by an overwhelming margin than tactics managing to, to influence weapons properly. Always remember this. Then it was the Argive's uh, shield, called Aspis, or occasionally Hoplon, from which the... Remember always that the Hellenic units were called, usually with the name of shields, and that tells you a dramatic lot about Hellenic military culture per se, right? The Romans called the, their units for the name of their weapons which tells you all the, the difference in mindset that exists between these two people and in culture and broadly man. Um, this, this this shield was roughly um, 80 centimeters to 1 meter in diameter. So we're talking about 32 39 inches. It had a distinctive broad, flat rim, while the rest, uh, say the rest of the shield was somewhat convex. Uh, it afforded a good protection. It was usually, you know, uh, it was rather heavy, right? And most shields in the ancient world, uh, you know, it was made of uh, essentially wood covered in uh, leather. The rim was um, basically always, as far as I understand, covered with uh, thin bronze sheet, essentially, while the, the wall front uh, often, right, but not, but definitely less, um, uh, in the same way, and the shield was uh, carried with with these two internal handles. One is the bronze porpax, that is basically this. Um, I don't know how to, to to define. It's like a um, 
it's like a, a plaque or kind of a yeah curve that you you insert the the tied to the shield of course to the internal of the shield to your shield you pass your forearm inside and then uh, inside the shield at the rim there was also a cord passing through certain rings it was known as the antilabe so you could grip you 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 the 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 arm remained well inserted into it right into the shield with through the port packs but you could also uh, grip it better with the hand with the antilabe um, and the extra cord looped around the ins- the inside of the shield could be slung over the shoulder to carry the same shield because it was very heavy right and sometimes these guys would simply go to combat uh, they could also fight uh, I mean, you can't see it even for, for with pikemen, right? They usually, uh, at that point, you have to hold the, the the weapon with two hands, right? This was a way naturally to mostly relax the uh, the arm in the first place, though. So also hoplites did it. You could do it depending on the situation. And um, let's say mm, there are there were other devices, like for example, the leather apron. It was like a literally a tissue um, in front of, uh, let's say, down the shield. It was like an extra defense against missiles. It was attached to a baton, could be fixed uh, usually to the outer face of the shield, sometimes like inside as well. Um, So basically you have under the shield this kind of uh, veil, uh, like with strong more resistance in leather, that could divert uh, projectiles and don't think that these things didn't work actually because uh, most projectiles would arrive at angles and speeds that were uh, you know let's say enough to, to be halted even in part by such uh, you know more I would say secondary means of diversion um, and it seems uh, it's a bit of a war gamistic thing that this the apron was used mostly in, in Asia because their arrows were more common than in Greece, but um, honestly, I don't think it's really like if you if you imagine a normal ancient combat like in Europe, wherever you you would you would see all these javelins, stones, arrows flying all over, right? So yes, the, in the east, um, fire was much more intense in a way because there were populations that relied much m- more heavily on archery. But, you know, th- this device was, you know, just, uh, just you know, it's so irrelevant in the world of warfare that you can't imagine if it existed, it existed for, for reasons that went beyond just a, a geographical divide, as always, by the way. Um, and how plight of our times here would, would have um, thin bronze greaves, mm-hmm. um, not universally, because um, you know that oplitic equipment tended to get lighter over time. But you know, greaves were still fairly common, and they would be designed to clip around the hoplite's legs by their own elastic, uh, elasticity, right? So with the same uh, legs flexing, you know, th- there would be ways it would they would you know stick to 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 the same um and they were usually molded to represent the muscles of the leg like you know these hoplites could have still some uh anatomic cuirass yes why not like most of them wouldn't because that would be too heavy but surely elite hoplites wore that right and there's nothing so strange about that at all but here we're talking about the type of the average right um sometimes these Greaves had uh, a red cloth lining turned over the edges, but it's just a detail. Uh, an average mm, helmet, there would be many varieties, but we can imagine of an attic type, for example, with hinged chick pieces and a horsehair crest held in a decorated crest box. Mm-hmm. Crests uh, were very important in, in the psychology of combat, uh, way more than we usually believe. They had a specifically, you know, uh, here the the whole plight would be naturally a guy deeply religiously imbued, right? You know, so like all ancient people of any kind, um, the crest together with the designs on the shields, the certain colors of the tunics, whatever, uh, ipo- apotropaic symbols, whatever, would give a character to this guy uh, and make him look taller and more intimidating, right? Um, 
and uh, the colors could be white, red, brown, black, right? It usually was for natural horse hair, but you know, they could be also dyed, uh, as you imagine. There could be also multiple colors in different sections of the crest. Uh, did at this time hoplites provide for drone equipment? Well, largely not anymore, at least. Um, I presume, of course, there was some consistent uh, part to it for what concerned the militias still, but let's say also the capacities of levying the militias in the cities were ever more tied to individual aristocratic houses. And in general, as we've seen, these hoplites were mostly mercenaries at some point. So um, mercenary employers would sometimes outfit their men as this, you know, city aristocrats, and very often with the, were the same people, right? Um, but still, um, this was mostly about having a kind, let's say, uh, kind of, you know, there was not a, a uniformity in the modern sense of the word, of course, right? So it wasn't very uniform, but still, you know, they, the, 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 there was a functionality to it. The most important thing about that was the armament, Right, the colors were relative. Um, the the only thing varying a bit more than the others part of the armaments um, of the uh, of the armor were helmets. Right, for some reason, because it's probably the most important, you know, f part of of the defense. You want to feel comfortable with that. Could be a reason. Uh, there was surely a certain degree of customization still. Uh, seemingly, many men under their helmets wore kind of a headband. This uh, served to restrain the hair, right, but could also support the helmet further. You can imagine some kind of padding internally or to, to create a... You know, to form, in fact, some kind of thickness that fixing it better and absorbing also better the, um, the hits with some kind of uh, material in between the head and the, and the helmet. Um, of course. Uh, in fact, um, alternatively, probably a padded cap was worn. Um, speaking of other elements, let's say, like the costume, right? They, they usually wore a woolen tunic, the keton, the, the, the normal kitten, right? Um, they came with different largeness. Um, some, you know, th there was some attempt of uniformity for some unit. For example, crimson somewhere, some source says. Um, otherwise, th we think colors would rarely be uniform as well. Um, in civilian life, this was this sense of the the nobility boasting uh, the whiteness of their clothes, <laughs> which is something that usually in wartime doesn't work pretty well. Uh, colors were mostly darker, like red, that usually for the blood, you know, to, to hide it in theory. Then, or terracotta, brown, gray, black, green, uh, including some shades, apparently called frog color and the color and or the color of an unripe grape. Also saffron yellow, seemingly. And, and this is interesting because the Athenian boy have uh, have been variously said to have worn black clothes, but to have worn yellow. So perhaps they, their tunics were, were yellow. Uh, blue also exists, still by seemingly uncommon. Um, tunics were usually embroidered at the edges, and they, they had patterns all over. Would they have some kind of even a in combat, some a utility? Yeah. I mean, we know in fencing, also from more modern times, a tunic can actually be a problem. Sometimes you can't pair or confuse height. It's, you know, it's never, you know, it's better to have a shield, really. But if you don't, right? And over the tunic, a hoplite would wear uh, a corslet. At this point, largely non-metallic. The commonest style of hoplite armor uh, since the end of the 6th century, as you know, was mostly made of either leather stiffened linen, at least modern writers properly think so. Uh, naturally, they, they could have, as we'll see, some, some actual actual metal parts within them. Um, ancient writers uh, call 
these linear coarseless properly uh, linear thoracus, as you know, with the so-called spolatus, which seem to be made of leather, right? And the linear thorax and the spolus were pro probably, in this sense, um, respectively, um, the the linen and leather version of of the coeras it, itself. So there could be metal scales interspersed, like either you know either or just on the on the flank, etc. Um, in this time, would would metal armor be less uh, frequent than before? Well, oh, yeah, overall yes. But there is this distinction to be made because, um, as you know, political warfare had properly here we're we're talking properly of an oplight, and that is to say not eventually the uh, if I, I I forgot to make this specific distinction in the beginning we're talking we're not talking about um Ificartan troops here we're talking properly of of classical oplite style troops um so the idea is that these troops would fight usually in a more individual way than the other ones because if you have an Ificartan phalanx then eventually you have Macedonian phalanx. You realize there that the individuality of the trooper is less important. Armies were larger, so also the expense of the armor would decrease altogether. So um, when we talk about political troops, here we have to think of contingents that remained of modest size, were f uh, provided either by mercenaries, uh, say mercenary uh, businessmen, say kind of condottieri, or uh, properly the city militias and let's say the larger the unit probably the lesser the equipment individually right but we were, we were speaking of hoplites that at this point have exactly because of the presence of more effective kind of uh, collectively trained units have to still fight with this shorter spears etc and going more individually well the, the idea is that yeah, metal armor would be still there, and it wouldn't be probably so rare as we think, right? Um, it's a bit difficult to properly stress, but um, these guys were properly heavy he infantry, so in a way or another, they had to, uh, they couldn't be just lighter troops, right? Especially the hoplites. And if you retain hoplite in a larger formation, trained to do specific things with specific equipment, etc., would be obviously lighter would need to be lighter to also invest in other aspects of its you know uh, you know combat capabilities the same goes for the macedonian phalange hope light less or so right so let's say it, they were less armored than before but still they were not dramatically you know without there there, there was surely also ten we made a video some time ago about properly unarmored hope lights which were also a thing at this point that is hoplites properly without armor except a helmet, um, that were needed so to be quicker, right? To do things that, you know, were driving away from, in part from the more agonistic type of combat of the heavier hoplites before, but that still required, in fact, more mobility, more adaptability on the field, right? So, yes, that's the reason why these guys would be on average lighter than, than previous times, but a political warfare altogether is not radically conceived about, you know, lack of arm. Um, unless there is properly, you see Spartans standard to do this because they said, you know, we, we are better at formation combat, so we don't need to invest in, in, in armor rather, more than others do because we can simply uh, overcome them in, in mobility and, and, and deploy them in speed and maneuvering and all this, that thing. Um, yes, but here, um, you know, that was in a time which still there were, there were mostly just phalanxes around, right? Or politic phalanxes around. Here it's it's something way more brutal. You start finding properly pikemen, you know, Celtic mercenaries, um, specialized troops like archers, or slingers, or, you know, also an important amount of cavalry. So the hoplite can't just be the light guy. There must be somebody in these units that still maintains, you know, a, a high degree of protection for hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? So that's my take on it. Um, in fact, even if you look at the, um, the Linothorax, 
even let's assume without metal parts uh, there would be elements of reinforcement for properly for the especially the the chest for for the torso properly because there was a, a u-shaped yoke fixed across the back and the u are brought forward over the shoulders and lays down on the chest this is a bit like you know a, an additional so, uh, shoulder piece right uh, usually also was decorated with bronze finials, uh, f excuse me, finials where the laces were attached. This is a bit like also the Romans had uh, over the Lorica Mat at some point, you know, on the shoulders. It was what the Celts had themselves. So this speaks for actually a heavier form of combat, right, that uh, needed this upper body protection, uh, additional protection. Uh, it was also, for example, a, a rectangular flap which stood up to protect the back of the neck from, from, from the back. Um, that is interesting because also, you see, the Romans, for example, tended to develop that over time, also a bit like the Celts did with this great neck guard. This is a different thing. This That, that, that comes from the helmet. This is said it's like a flap that opens uh, between the shoulders and it goes up to protect properly the neck, the nape, which could be also in in hoplitic combat, you know, as we were saying before, to to watch out for eventual hits also from the back, etc. But also speaks properly of a you know sometimes even more individual combat, uh, in a sense. Um, the uh, the cuirass wrapped around the body, tying under the left arm, or sometimes um, at least according to some base paintings, uh, occasionally down the front. Right, and it was split below the waist into strips called terugas, excuse me, that is fetters for, for ease the movements, right? So these were, uh, there would be also a second layer of terugas fixed inside the first, covering the gaps between them, so this was kind of some additional protection partially. The color of the couriers could vary, usually it was white, uh, often de decorated in red and black. Right, um, the um, the shoulder yoke and waistband sometimes were in darker color, um, and uh, yeah, that they, they they went along. They, they were you know a political formations like most formations at the time were all very colored, as, as you can imagine. That that's one aspect that we have kind of taken away from mostly the the idea of a metallic uh, face of warfare. That you know all these armies were some of the most colorful things you ever seen, all the time. Um, um, then um, there are other types of, I don't know, undivided skirt, uh, skirt instead of terugas sometimes, uh, some jerkins of flexible m materials um, with scalloped edges at the bottom, perhaps the sleeves. These, these things are shown from the, um, still from the Nereid uh, monument. While speaking of the, four, the early 4th century temple of Apollo at Bassai in Arcadia, there are um, Attic helmets without crests, for example. The crest could be, an, yeah, sometimes, you know, when some... There were certain... You see, the, the Attic helmet is very... Uh, it's more anatomical than others, right? It, it's uh, tendentially similar even to... I wouldn't say the delirium types, but I mean the concept is that you you want to have troopers that also do not get properly in in the melee to maybe hinge at something. So I don't know this is the idea I got right, which may suggest a more individual combat, but it's pure speculation at this point. Um, but yes, practicality seems to uh, for let's say I'll. A more dynamic combat seems to come on the fore, even in a political equipment at this time, right? Which means, in practice, that these troops were probably also um, uh, not uh, so mm, amateurial as we were thinking before, but that often these political formations would be composed maybe by either by professionals and or mm, the elite of society sometimes, right? Most of them would be scum, as we've seen, because the elites had gentrified, etc. But there was still, in in the form of, of um, the police aristocracy, some kind of need to send, I've seen before, the Athenian boy, for example. So, you know, the younger, so they, they're not just 
every Athenian, right? There, there is an aristocratization of warfare, of, um, you know, of, of um, you know, of also military career that would pass, I presume, in Hellenic culture specifically, through the idea that you have to pass through the phalanx, right? Because that was still the, the eco of a kind of a democratic um, ideal, still living, albeit hypocritically now, in an ever more gentrified Hellenic society. Um, and uh, let's say um, it's it's yeah it's difficult sometimes to 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 catch these uh, uh, shades, but it's important also to understand. And sometimes we will talk also probably properly about the employment of these units, talking about properly Hellenic tactics and or specific battles to understand what these guys had to fight into. Right, which surely wasn't an easier um, warfare than it had been before. There were much, many more threats, danger, uh, difficulties, and therefore these troops, if if they were still around, they had to be prepared for it. And this has to do with a very specific kind of uh, you know of mindset, training, equipment that. That here is, is exemplified. Anyhow, I'm sorry to cut so early for such um, a, a big topic, but let's say um, we can't say everything at a time. Also, sometimes it's difficult properly to, to say something because we don't know really much. For, we'll talk surely about political warfare again. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.